Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, an ancient document that may very well hold the secret to the Antichrist being a Roman leader uh, or even possibly consecutive leaders of Roman descent. Going to be getting into that this evening. And of course, one of the plumb lines of the documents that we're speaking about is Shem Tob's Hebrew Gospel of the, Ma of, of the Book of Matthew. This is a document that has been held by Jewish sages for just centuries on end now. Uh, they've used their Hebrew version of the Book of Matthew to be able to debate Christian scholars over the centuries. And yet, not only has this book given us some very compelling evidence evidence of the identity of the Antichrist, but comparing this to the actual correct translation of the book of Daniel, another very powerful uh, insight that has unraveled some mysteries here, and of course some of the latest moves by Pope Francis. This information all combined together is just amazingly giving us some insight to the modern day Antichrist and exactly how this has worked down through the centuries. I say down through the centuries because of the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, etc. Some of the things that were written there in John's writings there also identify that there is more than one Antichrist, but there would be a main Antichrist coming in the final days. Going to be going into that as well as Jesus' word from the book of Matthew, Matthew 24. So get, sit back, put your seatbelt on, you're in for a ride. Don't forget to share this video. Don't forget to support this ministry. Very important you do that. Visit us, IsraeliNewsLive.org. Your support is what keeps this type of messages continually coming forth. And I have to tell you, friends, this was only by the leading of the Holy Spirit, been, been pressed by the Holy Spirit for weeks now to go back and re-examine those words that Jesus said, uh, referring back to Daniel's prophecy about the abomination that maketh desolate. I couldn't get away from it. And finally, when I did, the breakthrough came. So let's get right into it. I want to thank Dr. Rosa for sharing this particular uh, news broadcast with me here. Pope Francis, world government must rule U.S. for their own good. I mean, are you serious? We're talking about the pontiff, the Pope of Rome, Pope Francis, supposedly just a spiritual leader, but clearly showing the authority of the church with the two keys on the flag there, both spiritual and temporal powers of the world, saying the U.S. needs to be under a world government rule for their own good. You don't think that they're not paying attention? Sure they are. Let's look at what it says here in this July 9th, 2017 document. Pope Francis told Italian newspaper La Repubblica that the United States of America has a distorted vision of the world and Americans must be ruled by a world government as soon as possible for their own good. Hmm. The Pope made the observation in an interview with La Repubblica reporter uh, Eugenio Scalfari, don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, last Thursday I got a call from Pope Francis uh, it was about noon and I was at the newspaper when my phone rang. He said uh, Pope Francis had been watching Putin and Trump in the G20 and had become agitated. Watch that word, they're agitated. The Pope demanded to see him at four that afternoon according to the Google translation of the Italian report. Pope Francis told me, be very concerned about the meeting of the G20, Scalfari wrote. As, an, as uh, translated into English by uh, Agence France Prassy, which picked up the story, the Pope said, I am afraid there are very dangerous alliances between powers who have distorted view of the world, America and Russia, China and North Korea, Russia and Assad and the war in Syria. The danger concerns immigration, the Pope continued to La Repubblica. Our main and unfortunately growing problem in the world today is that of the poor, the weak and the excluded, which includes migrants. Now that all seems good by the Pope of Rome. But before the end of this broadcast, you're going to find out that the migrant situation is a money-making machine. Not just the wars, but the migrant situation is as well. Let's take a look at exactly where we're going to with this. As I shared with you the other day, when I gave you the, the, the very article from The Hill, 
Speaking on the same thing, I also went into how that this is the prophecy of Daniel. Uh, we're looking at Daniel chapter 11 there. And let me just see if I have it at the right place here. Nope, not that Daniel there. Uh, here we go right here. Verse 44, but tidings out of the east, now the north shall trouble him or agitate him is another good way. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many or take away many, destroying them. Now, you might say, well, Steve, the Pope is agitated, all right, but he's not talking about going out there and continuing to, to war on out there. You better watch and see what he's planning on doing. But let's first look at the identity. Let's go back to John, 1 John, in fact. Verse 18, little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, and even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest, and that they were not all of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Here it is. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Now that seems pretty simple, and well, just face value, doesn't it? It's not quite that simple though, friends. Not quite that simple. Let's take a look over here at Daniel here. Um, excuse me, not in Daniel there, but uh, going back. So we've got 1 John right there. As I shared with you though, Daniel, that the Pope, being that agitated one, or he is troubled by that tidings out of the East and out of the West. And of course, as we can see, some of the reasons why this article here, a little bit older though, coming out on April 14, 2017, World War III could start Russia and China may join forces against US, North Korea expert, expert warns. Now, why is it a problem for him to begin with? Because the Pope is busy trying to bring prophecies to pass in the Middle East because the Pope has been working on this two-state solution with the United States being one of the lead negotiating teams for him and getting control of the old city. The last thing Pope Francis needs is for Donald Trump to get caught up with Russia or to get involved in a war with North Korea. You see, this is all undermining exactly what the Pope is trying to achieve. And the Pope is also working on trying to make sure all the prophecies fall into place at the, at the simulti simultaneous point, being the fact that, well, Damascus has to fall according to Isaiah 17, being that Gog of Magog, Russia has to strike Israel. Israel's got to do something that draws in the Gog of Magog war. There's got to be a thousand year millennial reign. The, 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 uh, the coming Messiah rules with a rod of iron. Of course, he's got a little bit different idea about what the rod of iron should be. See, so these are all the prophecies that Rome has been working on for thousands of years. They, don't, they do not think, the, the Pope of Rome does not think, uh, they don't sit there and, and try to figure things out by the next day or the next minute. They think in terms of centuries on what they're going to do to bring these things to pass. When they saw the Jews returning home in 1858 under the Ottoman Empire, passing a law to try to raise money for taxes, and Jews went there and began to buy land inside of the, uh, the ancient homeland, then, then the Pope of Rome began to join forces with the British Empire. And then by, by the time of World War I, some, what, 60 years later, they bring down the Ottoman Empire to stop the migration of the Jewish people back to their homeland so that they could control it. And when the British mandate said they were going to give a home for the Jewish people, they didn't allow them to go home. Oh, a little trickle here and there, but when the World War II started as well, they made sure they killed off as many Jews as they could. Friends, this is a lot deeper than what you realize. All right, but let's get into the main point of this. It's very, very deep what we're going to go into here. So, 
What I want to share with you, let's begin to look at the prophecies and how they actually line out here. Now, this, is, this was the prophecy that the Lord dealt with me the most on. And that was, He kept putting in my heart, go back and look at Matthew 24, verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them which are in the house stop not come down, take away, take, take anything out of his house. All right, now that seems simple enough, but, it, but everybody that looks at this prophecy, Jesus says, When you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Okay, then those that are in Judea, go to the, flee to the mountains. Everybody's looking at this as a future event. Right? But you don't understand. It is past, present, and future event. All right? And, and I couldn't understand it. When I, when I first saw I knew the, how this scripture was written here. I also know that if you look at Matthew 24, just back up. You shall hear of wars and rumors of war, verse 6. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places, and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and you shall and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold but he that endure unto the end the same shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations then shall the end come when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place what does he say you that are in Judea flee to the mountains all right now the Holy Spirit kept dealing with me. Go back and look at that. I mean, I'm talking weeks now. Two, three weeks I've been going through this. It kept coming to my heart. And I'm like, what in the world is it? I don't understand this. All right. So I began to go back. And I actually first went back to the Hebrew version of Daniel. All right. Now, before I go there, though, I'm going to first read to you where this is from. Some of us would think Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 plays into this. And I'm going to go there in just a few moments. But the actual verse that Yeshua is speaking about here, Jesus, is from Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So we all look at this scripture in English from the King James Version, or it doesn't matter which version you use in English. They're pretty much all almost identically the same here. But we take this for face value, and so we all are waiting for someone to put some kind of statue or something of, of whether it be uh, Prince Harry or, or, or Pope Francis or somebody, and they're going to build a third temple and put a statue in there. It has nothing to do with that. One, you have to know about what it says in the Hebrew language before you can really understand. But before I go there, I'm going to show you how the Hebrew Matthew, Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew, actually words this. All right, now let's take a look at this. This is actually here. This document right here. This is Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew. This is, the, the, this is the version of the book of Matthew that was written in Hebrew that was used by the Jewish people. Uh, I forget what, how far back this dates. I believe they believed that the, the document that it, was, that it was copied from was at least from, from the 5th century. Now, I don't remember for sure on the details of that, but I think that's correct. Nonetheless, it's also believed by the sages, uh, by the church fathers, that Matthew actually wrote his first gospel in the Hebraic language. Not in the Greek, not in Latin, but in the Hebraic language. Now, this is not to say that this is from Matthew's original writing. I'm not saying that there. But we know that the, the, uh, the, the uh, Jewish rabbis used this version of the Matthew's Gospel to be able to debate with the scholars of their day uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. In verse 15, this is where he talks about uh, the actual 
abomination. He says right here in on your screen here, Ha Omer Arpe Daniel Omed, okay? And then he talks about here, talking about the abomination that stands in the holy place there. In case okay, so he says he's from the from actually from the mouth of Daniel, uh, uh, standing in the holy place there. But it's the first word that he uses here, and he actually uses a Greek word, but it's transliterated. And it's actually Antichristos. The Antichrist is what he says there. This Antichrist, all right? Now, let me just go ahead and use the English version for you. Make it a little bit simpler so you can see this better. All right? And uh, verse 15 right here. This is the Antichrist. Let me back up to verse 14. And this gospel, that is this evangelion, will be preached in all the earth for a witness concerning me to all nations, then the end will come. This is the Antichrist, and this is the abomination which desolates, which was spoken by Daniel, uh, standing in the holy place, let uh, one who reads understand. All right, now there's some key things here that you've really got to understand. First off, He's talking about right before the Antichrist that the gospel has got to be preached first. The, in other words, this is actually going to be more than one period of time that this happens. But he says this Antichrist, this is the Antichrist, this is the abomination which desolates, which is spoken by the Daniel standing in the holy place. So the one that actually stands in the holy place is going to be the Antichrist himself. Let the one who reads understand. Then he says, then those who are in uh, that are in Judah, let them flee to the mountains. All right? So he's prophesying of a future event, but it's going to go much more in the future. But you have to go back to Daniel, because he refers to you in Daniel. The, the, adv the advantage in Shem Tob's Hebrew Gospel of Matthew is the fact that he identifies that the, one, that the abomination or the filthiness is the Antichrist himself. And it's the Antichrist himself that is going to stand in the holy place. But what holy place is he talking about? That's what's really interesting when you begin to look at this. So let me take you and show you what he's actually saying. Let's go to uh, uh, the book of Daniel, and we're going to look at this in the Hebrew language right here. This is where it gets very interesting. All right. Now, I'm not going to use... This is from memory, mechonmemory.org, uh, their website there, their English translation. A uh, little bit more difficult on this particular one here. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall profane the sanctuary, even the stronghold, and shall take, uh, take away the continual burnt offering, and they shall set up the detestable thing that causeth appallment. Yeah, like I said, it's a little bit more difficult to read that one there than what most people are used to, used to where you say, And the arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination to make it desolate. Now, actually, the King James is better translated than the Hebrew uh, memory version is there. If you notice the word sacrifice, though, is italicized. So the word sacrifice is not even there. But here's what concerns me, is the translation period. It says, and arms shall stand on his part. That just sounds strange to begin with. An arm shall stand on his part. Let's look at it in Hebrew now. Now, the word arm in Hebrew, this would be your root right here. The word arm, though, would be spelled zayn resh avav, av, uh, avav here in the middle, then an ayin. Za'a, pronounced the same way, za'a. See, uzarim, and you could, if you want to translate it arm, go ahead. But if you take the word za'a in Hebrew, it means seed. Descendants, lineage, the children, uzarim, and the children, mimenu ya'amdo, ya'amdu, all right? So the seed shall stand on his part. Actually, a better way would be which they, uh, the arm or the lineage from which they stand. All right, it's very difficult the word Hebrew to begin with. So, so the so the lineage or the seed or the children from which they stand. Now we have on here they shall profane the sanctuary, but literally they shall wound or they're going to they're they're, they're wounding the holiest 
the stronghold of the holiest. They're going to kill the Messiah is what it's talking about. And that's why I say you could use the word arm here. You don't just have to have the seed. It could be the arm because the arm here represents the strength. So, or the descendants which, which are standing to basically with the lineage or the descendants or the arm that stand that are going to stand which they shall stand, they will wound the strongest of the holiest, or the strong of the holiest, meaning the Messiah. This is really what it is. The Holy of Holies inside the temple was where the spirit of the Shekinah glory, this is where the Holy Spirit came down. It's where God himself would come down and be amongst his people. When Yeshua, when Jesus came down, he was the one. He was the, the whole, he was, the, the, was God in flesh coming down, dwelling, and they came after the strong one of the holies. See, it's not necessary. I mean, you could translate sanctuary. It's fine. Hamikadosh is what we use for the word sanctuary or the temple. All right. But they're not just going to profane it. They're going to wound him. I mean, the thing is, is the whole prophecy is showing you that the Messiah is the one that is in this verse here. All right. And he shall. I actually, I took the time. Let me just share with you here. When I looked at the way the words are being translated here, I, I sat down and I really looked at this and I'm, I'm like, okay, let's translate this to where it makes the right sense here. The arm or the lineage, all right, from which they stand will wound and take away the strength of the holies. They shall give in place the abomination that desolates, that, that makes desolate. What, all right, that's the other thing that's so, so fascinating right here. See, here's your word right here for give, Natan. Ve Natanu, they will give. It's in place of. What is, what is Daniel saying here when he talks about the abomination that makes desolate? Just like Yeshua says in, in Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew. It's the Antichrist. In other words, they're wounding the true Holy One. They're wounding the true Holy One. Remember... Mm. I'm so excited about this. My brain cannot even think fast enough or to keep up with what's in my heart. Yeshua, according to Isaiah 9, was called the what? The El Gibor. El Gibor is the mighty God. Okay? The mighty God. What are they doing? They are wounding the strong the holy, the strong, the holy, the strong of the holies. I, I, I'm looking at Hebrew, so you have to think a little bit differently the way the wording is laid out here. So they're wounding the one that is strong, the, the strong one of the holy one there, which he was the strength. He was the El Gibor, the mighty God. The mighty God was had come down. He was the holy one of Israel, right? We call him the holy one. He is called the Mik, uh, Mik, uh, Mikodash. See? So Yeshua, it is the Messiah that they're speaking about, but there's these ones, this one of this lineage here that are going to stand up against him. They're going to wound him. They're going to replace him and give instead of him the abomination that makes desolate. And Matthew's Hebrew gospel, what does he do here? I keep hitting the wrong one right there. He says, this is the Antichrist. That is the abomination which desolates, which was spoken by Daniel. So, I, I know, friends, I, I'm probably making this more confusing by the way I'm expressing this right here because you just have to understand the way the Hebrew language is laid out. So, regardless of how you do the beginning of verse 31 there, it still clearly says in there, from which they stand. So, this is a lineage of people here from which they stand. They will wound the, the strength of the Holy One. And then it goes on, as it goes on to stay there, and they, uh, uh, then it says, they shall give in place, uh, I put on there in place, and word in place, not there, they shall give the abomination that desolates, that makes desolate. So what are they doing? They're wounding the, they're, they're wounding the true Christ, the true anointed one, they're wounding him. The true holy one is being wounded. He has been taken out. And they're putting in place the abomination that maketh desolate. All right. So when Yeshua was warning his apostles, 
when he when he warns them in Matthew right here when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place let them then which be in Judea flee into the mountains all right John said there were many antichrists right they went out from us because they were not of us you remember what happened in Nicaea Rome 325 AD you remember these are the lineage of those that rejected the true Messiah not to say they didn't believe that Yeshua was Messiah but they had their own version of the way it should play out and so we got the Constantinople religion the beginning of the Catholic Church there were many church fathers that did not agree with what they were doing but that's how we got the first Catholic Church was at that time there so when John says there were many that went out from, uh, from us because they were not of us that was because there was a division in what Yeshua brought as being the true gospel and some of them just didn't like everything he had to say so that division come to fruition but before that came to fruition you have to remember Titus the Roman general comes down to Israel and destroys the temple in 70 AD because Yeshua had already told them about the abomination that maketh desolate they knew according to prophecy that the abomination that maketh desolate would be a Roman king a Roman lineage all right as I said to you here Daniel it is a seed not just the word arm you could use the word arm if you want which still would be the strength but it is a seed it is a lineage that's going to stand up now how did they know that it would be a Roman leader and that would be the beginning of the Antichrist spirit moving in power and in strength well let's look over here then to Daniel uh, chapter 9 and look at verse let me back up here to verse 24 and we'll come down 70 weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sin and to forgive iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision of the prophet and to anoint the most holy place this is why people think that well it's going to be some statue well, I'll agree with you on one thing. I do believe they're going to build a third temple. And yes, the Pope of Rome will go stand inside that third temple as well. So he's trying to manufacture this prophecy as I already brought out to you through, through Mechadeshit, where he's trying to bring back the three monotheistic religions together. He's trying to declare to them that the Messiah is coming and they want to build a third temple, etc. He's working with Turkey, Villa very diligently with rabbis etc to bring about the building of the third temple to manufacture prophecy the way he thinks it should be know therefore and discern that from the going forth of the word to restore and build Jerusalem until, until unto one anointed a prince that is a Mashiach that is the true Christ shall be seven weeks and four and three score and two weeks and it shall be built again with a broad place and a moat but in troublous times and after three score and two weeks shall be anointed one be cut off the Mashiach the Messiah will be cut off and be no more and the people of a prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary but his end shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined so in other words when the prince there's another prince coming he's not the Mashiach he's not an anointed prince but he is still considered a prince which makes him what well according to Shem Tov's uh, Hebrew gospel he's the Antichrist he because Shem Tov says that the Antichrist is the abomination of desolation so what is he saying what is Daniel bringing out here the Antichrist is the one that makes desolate and even it says here and unto the end of the war desolations are determined so not only did he destroy the temple in 70 AD but he would always be about destruction and yet he's supposed to be taking the place of Christ not necessarily Titus at that time 
But once the Vatican got their pontiffs going, all Roman princes, that's exactly what began to happen. Now watch what it says here. And he shall make a firm covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. And upon the wing of detestable things shall be that which causeth appallment, and that until the extermination wholly determined be poured out upon that which causeth appallment. All right, now it's worded different naturally in the uh, English version of this. But the point being is, he causeth the sacrifice. In the midst of that week, he causes that sacrifice to cease. That was actually Rome. Under Roman rule, they killed Yeshua as the Messiah. He was that true sacrifice that came to an end. And they replaced him, thinking by killing him, they replaced him with a Roman ruler. And that has been the case ever since. Titus, it was Roman rule that put Yeshua to death. The true the Jewish rabbis, even the high priests, the Pharisees, convicted Yeshua, had him sentenced, but they couldn't put him to death, so they sent him to the Roman prefect, and he had him put to death. And so in his place, they sent Titus, the Roman general, down in 70 AD, destroyed the temple, and Rome has had a stranglehold on the gospel ever since. I'll show you some more. It doesn't just end there, friends. Not at all. All right, now let's look at Daniel, the way he words it. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. That's the end of all things, friends. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Nothing but war. No wonder why Yeshua says over here in Matthew's gospel here, if you go back up before he goes into this guy here, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of war, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. These are all the beginning of sorrows. But we're all the way down here where Daniel also prophesies that tidings out of the east, now the north trouble him. The Pope came out of the closet. He may not have realized how he gave himself away, but he gave himself away. So, it was interesting. Trump, it, it, it really almost looks like when we look at President Trump that he is trying to do good. And I really would like to think he, he is. Some people say, though, that he's a Mason. Well, the Masons are very loyal to the Vatican, if that's the case. But Trump also knows the deep state's trying to undermine his presidency. The Vatican is very much involved in the deep state. Let me share some other things with you. U.S. This came out on The Guardian. Just came out. The U.S. Syria policy sign of a shift as Trump's son meets pro-Russian Damascus figure. I'll tell you one thing. You want to know the best sign to know that President Trump was a genuine president trying to do good for the American people? If they remove him from power as president, then you will know the man was trying to do the right thing. That'll be the one true sign. And I know many people believe that he is. And I would like to think the same thing as well from the different things that I'm watching happening. But I can tell you one thing. I don't care what President Trump is doing. The deep state is still controlling what's happening in America. Look at this right here. This picture was just shared with Lorenzo and already happened. This is U.S. tanks in Hungary, in Hungary, in the country of Hungary and Eastern Europe. The U.S., the whole time while President Trump is trying to do some headway with President uh, Putin there, they're preparing for war. Keeping Russia at bay while the Pope makes sure he brings prophecy to pass in the Middle East. 
Russian activities, they're saying forces in the air and sea space is growing concern in NATO. They're trying to ramp it up, make it look like Russia is a major threat there to the European Union. That's only to justify. They got all these troops. I'm beginning to realize now why they have Russia surrounded. The thing is, is they're afraid that Russia would step in and try to alter what's going on in the Middle East and, and realize that the Pope of Rome is trying to gain control of Jerusalem. Because you have to remember, they tried under the Soviet Union when the Vatican invaded and toppled the Russian Empire under the Tsars, and they put in, you know, the likes of... Uh, uh, Stalin and, and Lenin, these were Jesuit trained men to try to crush the Eastern beliefs that the Russian Orthodox Church had. When communism fell, they had thought they had won, only to find out they had lost. They didn't destroy the, the, the Eastern Church that had survived all these years of the brutal dictatorship under the under the communist uh, regimes and so now with Russia reviving in its military strength they're concerned that they would lose that grip on power and that they would be in competition for getting control of Jerusalem this is why tidings out of the East and out of the North trouble him. China and Russia are troubling the Vatican because it could slow down the progress of the two-state solution, of getting control of Jerusalem. And the last thing he wants the world to know is that he truly is the Antichrist. So, the state of the nation. This was an article that I came across that I wanted to see, does the Vatican really have a strong connection to the deep state? Because we read in the, in the article over here just a moment ago that the Pope seems to care about the displaced refugees, etc. And so I ran across this article here, State of the Nation, Alternative News and Commentary, who really owns and controls the military industrial complex. This is a mega lengthy article and there's more than one part to it but I took and I ran through a word processor to pull out some things where he speaks about the Vatican in here just to see I didn't know if he'd speak about the Vatican or not so I ran it in there all right first I wanted to quote to you because he quotes John F Kennedy April 27 1961 the richest and most powerful people in the world belong to the Knights of Malta the equestrian order of the Holy Sepulchre I apologize, that is not John Kennedy, here we go. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on con uh, uh, covert means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conquered a vast human and material resources into building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed but not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned. No rumor is printed. No secret is revealed. John F. Kennedy said this April 27, 1961. No wonder why they didn't let him live. But let me, write to you, let me read to you what some of this article actually stated here. The richest and most powerful people in the world belong to the Knights of Malta. The equestrian order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem, the order of Garter, the, the uh, Teutonic Knights, and many other orders that vow allegiance to the Vatican. If we wish to broaden the perspective, one can add that the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, are involved at all levels and have worked tirelessly as soldiers of the Pope to create the ultimate spy network. That's one part. The Vatican makes money from war. Another section of the article. All banking started in Italy and was connected to the Vatican. It is fair to say 
that the central banking ideas of Italy have been re replicated in the central banking systems used throughout the world. Central banking comes from the Vatican and through the different agencies of the Vatican, Knights of Malta, the world economy is manipulated by insider trading information that is being shared with the Vatican via the vows of allegiance that every Knight of Malta makes. The Vatican profits by war because it takes in hundreds of billions a year through refugee placement services and humanitarian aid provided to war-torn areas. The more war, the richer the Vatican becomes. That is why the Vatican supports unbridled migration of people and the chaos that ensues from war. The Knights of Malta are one of the largest charities in the world. The Catholic Church has thousands of different tax-free uh, uh, charitable organizations that receive money to help in humanitarian causes. No one knows how much money the Catholic Church receives each year. The Vatican Bank has been caught many times laundering money on a huge scale. I even know we did a report here on Israeli News Live back when Obama was president and they were opening up the border down there when the Pope was saying they should open up the border to the migrant uh, people from, from Mexico and it was because the churches there were awarded millions of dollars in funds. So he's right. The military industrial complex created the war on terror and calls it the long soft war because it will not it will never end. The, pro, uh, the pronouncement of war on terror was de the declaration of the overthrowing of America democracy by warlord oligarchy. Only a few people benefit from this war and often politicians who declare the New World Order take up positions and corporations that profit from war. Former presidents and prime ministers become corporate warlords and make a fortune. American democracy is doomed. If the following corporations continue to exist, American democracy will fall and become the military arm of the triangle of power between New York, uh, the city of London, and the Vatican City. These seeming vague Ident uh, indications will be elaborate in the rest of this article, but for now, let's review an outline who owns and controls the military industrial complex. Basically, the Vatican is at the head of it. But it's easy to talk peace and safety when there is none. That's why Jesus said, they will talk of peace and safety, and yet, sudden destruction. That's what's so fascinating. And as I come across this remarkable revelation that we clearly see, and I just have to say this in closing again, friends, when you look at Daniel's prophecy from the Hebraic language, Daniel 11, verse 31, he is clearly stating here, and instead of using the word seeds, like I said, you can use the word arm if you want. I'll highlight it here on the screen for you so you can see it. There it is. Zara in Hebrew means seeds. Seed, actually, Zara. The Yod Mem makes it plural. And seeds, if you want to say the word arm, we normally add a Vav in there. Between the Resh and the Ain. Either way, the arm just means strength. Or powers. You might even use for there. But I would translate it easier to say the lineage, the lineage from which they stand will wound and take away the strength of the holy. They shall give in place the abomination that makes desolate. In other words, Daniel prophesied before Yeshua ever come on the scene. He prophesied in Daniel chapter 9 that the prince that shall that, that, that the anointed prince would be cut off, didn't he? Daniel 9, chapter 9 clearly says that the anointed prince would be cut off, and the prince that shall come would destroy that would, that would come from the people that would destroy the city and the sanctuary. Showing you in Daniel chapter 9 that there was coming a false prince that was going to replace the anointed prince. And then in chapter 11, he lets you know that the, the lineage, they will stand and they will wound the strong anointed, the strong holy one, in other words. 
and they would put in place an abomination that makes everything desolate. In other words, the, their prince would be a murderous prince that will go through the world murdering and killing to conquer, kill, and destroy. I mean, there's so many scriptures that come to my mind as, I, as I've been getting the revelation on this. I, I can't even begin to fathom to tell you everything. It's all coming together now. It makes sense. As I said, Daniel chapter 9, just going back over there again. What did he say? And after three score and two weeks shall, see, shall an anointed one be cut off and be no more. Yeshua, the Messiah. And the people of the prince that shall come dis, uh, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Titus, the Roman general. See? But Titus doesn't destroy it. The people that shall come. But his end shall be with a flood, and to the end of the war, desolations are determined. All the way through his whole reign. He's nothing but a desolator. The Roman Empire replaced the Babylonian kingdom, kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. That's why Revelation calls it Mystery Babylon. My friends, I mean, Shem, Shem, uh, Shem Tob, that's how we say his name, Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew, right there, plain as day. I don't know, I can't highlight that one. Plain as day. Antichristos. He calls the abomination of desolation. He calls the, the word abomination is the word that he calls as the Antichristos. In the Hebrew Matthew, the abomination, the filthy one, that prince that shall come, is called the Antichrist. All right? And that's just giving you right here. Here it is. This is the Antichrist, and this is the abomination which desolates, which was spoken by Daniel. The Antichrist is the abomination which will desolate. Look at the world today. I mean, are, are we blind not to see this? The Antichrist is the one doing it. Maybe this is why a lot of people thought that Obama was the Antichrist. But every time Obama leaves, another president takes his place, the wars keep going. The wars are controlled by Rome. They pretend to make it look like they want an end to the wars, but he doesn't. The Pope declaring the, that the U.S. needs to be controlled by a world government you don't think he won't take down your sovereignty as well? He might allow Russia to nuke the mess out of the United States just to be able to do it. Friends, this is serious. This is very serious. We are living in a very late, late, late hour. So, and he shall make a firm covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and offering to cease. It's just backtracking. He makes the covenant, but he killed the Messiah. And then Daniel 11. Right there. And the seed from which they stand here it is. Me main nu ya amdu, from which they stand. And they will wound, it's plural, they will wound the holy, the strong. Remember Yeshua, remember what I said. Isaiah 9 called him El Gibor, the mighty strength, the strength, mighty God. He is the Holy One, the Holy One of Israel. They will wound him. Who wounds him? That lineage right there that stands up. Daniel saw it coming. Daniel said in Daniel 9 that he'd be cut off, not for himself. Everything prophesying of the Messiah. No wonder why they never translated this right. It too easily gives away that Yeshua is the Messiah. But the reason why Rome doesn't want you to know the truth is because why? Right here. And they will give 
basically they're given in place of the true anointed, the true holy one, the true holy mighty one. They're given its place. The abomination that makes desolate. You know what that reminds me of? Remember when they brought out Judas, not Judas, but they brought out uh, Barabbas? The Romans did. Which one do you want? Barabbas or Jesus? Which one should we let free for you? And the Jews chose Barabbas, the murderer. We could have got Jesus, but instead we got the murderer. That's why we got a Roman hierarchy that has waged war for nearly 2,000 years. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live prophetic segment today. There's a lot of people that don't like to support what I do because I'm, I'm not afraid to tell you the truth. Regardless of the consequences, I'll still stand and tell you the truth. If you appreciate this type of broadcast, I don't know if I, know if I should call it news, but in this case here, this type of broadcast, this is what is a blessing to you, to someone that is willing to tell you the truth. You'd be the few that would be willing to stand with us. We do thank you. And we thank you because it's a big courage for you to stand there and support this type of ministry as well. Because many walk away. When I tell you the truth, they walk away. So it's not a rose bed of flowers for us. And now that we're on television in America, um, I don't talk about it that much because I don't want to constantly pound people for money. God knows what we have need of. And we make do by His grace. But if you want to really stand with us, we do need your help. Stand with us. Support this ministry. You can do so by going to our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. If you're on Israeli News Live YouTube channel, a little donation link right above the subscribe link. You can click that. We can try to make it as easy as we possibly can. And of course, our address here in the Czech Republic appears as well. Uh, we do have family here, so if you want to give, you can send a check or money order to the address on your screen, Post Office Box 46 15006 Praha, that's the check name for Prague, Praha 56 Czech Republic. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Please, friends, share this video. I know it was lengthy and maybe even confusing to some degree, but share it with as many people as you possibly can. Shalom.